at verse number 15, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 15. Brothers, I think that Scott would have me to remind you that next Sunday morning, following the morning worship, brothers will gather for a moment, amen. Next Sunday morning, following morning worship, brothers will gather for a moment. there say amen. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, he sent once and again to my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell. Let me say that one more time. An odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So in the reading of the word of the Lord, thank you. You may be seated in the sanctuary. I'm going to ask you to do something, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be a little rough, what I'm going to ask you to do, but if and you can, find a neighbor who you can look right on the good eyes, and say, neighbor, neighbor don't, let don't let your stuff, your stuff start stinking. Start stinking. Start stinking. Start stinking. Start stinking. I want to find a neighbor on the other side, don't tell that one. Tell a different one. If you gotta look behind you, find another neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor don't, let don't let your stuff, your stuff start stinking. Start Amen. Stinking. Verse number 18. Verse number 18. Paul says, an odor of a sweet smell. Isn't that in your Bible? It's in my Bible. An odor of the sweet smell. So today I'm going to talk about don't let your stuff start stinking. Thank you so much, ushers and nurses. Amen. Some of you are quite aware that good can go bad. Amen. You aware of that? That stuff that is good can sometimes go bad. Okay. Some of you know that milk even though the slogan is, does the body good, milk can turn sour. Good milk, vitamin D enriched milk, even lactate milk can go bad. Not only is that true with milk, but some of you know that even good food 
can go bad. It can spoil. What once might near drove you crazy with its good aroma. If it turns and goes bad, will equally drive you crazy with its bad aroma. I stepped into some places where some cooking was going on and I said, oh, there's a cripple in the house. And I don't mean to sound ugly about that. We just talk about it when people really know how to cook, they put their foot in it. And when I step in and I smell a certain fragrance, I smell a certain aroma, I smell a certain odor, I say, oh yeah, there's a cripple in the house because somebody did put their foot off into this food. I can tell by the smell that it's going to be a delicious, delightful, and delectable meal. But that same meal that's so good at one moment can become not so good at another moment. Because the food has spoiled. It's set out too long. It didn't have the right temperature to maintain the quality of its Goodness, I could belabor the point and give you some other analogies and ideas, but I think that you got the gist of it already. Much as I know how Johnny likes to eat, I'm sure he can appreciate what I'm saying right now. Amen. Good can go bad, but you don't want your good to go bad whenever it is within your power to keep it from happening. What is the fragrance of your worship today? Because I need you to know what is good or what good could go bad. What is the fragrance? What is the odor? What is the aroma? Not only in relationship to your worship today, but also your work for the Lord. Because that which was good can change and become bad. Once upon a time, you looked forward to it. You was excited. You were enthusiastic, you were energetic, you loved to be on the Lord's program, but somehow or another, what was once good has now started to go bad. Help me hear somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, whatever you do, don't let your stuff Start speaking. What is the fragrance of your fellowship? Because, you know, people who used to be smiley people, happy people, uh, people who are very cordial, sometimes things can shift and change. And the spirit that used to be there ain't there no more. It can happen in the home, it can happen on the job, and it can even happen in the church. Where once what was good has somehow or another a man spoiled and turned and now is bad. What even is the fragrance of your giving. Paul says that when I look at the giving of this Philippian church, I've got to say it is an odor of a sweet smell. But I need to tell you that if we ain't doing it right, if we ain't acting right, if we don't have the right spirit, and if we don't have, you understand, uh, 
uh, the right sense of gratitude, what used to be good can now be no good. Because of what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. This text today focuses, number one, on the labor of Pastor Paul. I call him Pastor Paul because the church at Philippi, as many other churches, is a church that Paul is primarily responsible for starting. It is because of him and because of his ministry that there is an active congregation of Christian believers in the city of Philippi. You can't deal with the book of Philippians and the city of Philippi or the church at Philippi without looking at, first of all, the labors of Pastor Paul. Today, as I preach from this text, we understand that Paul is not teaching from the pulpit at the church in Philippi. He is literally doing his work from a Roman prison cell. He's not in jail because he's committed some atrocious crime. He's not in jail because he was packing a concealed weapon. He's not in jail because he has a proliferate money from the local church congregation. He's not in jail because of income tax evasion. He's not in jail because of a whole lot of things that we could assign to criminals. He's simply in jail because he was true to his calling as a gospel preacher of Jesus Christ. Being the preacher that he is, he has found himself incarcerated by those who want to silence the gospel message. And for those who want to try to put Christianity on the back burner or no burner at all. They felt if we can imprison this preacher by the name of Paul who got his calling and anointing on a road called Damascus. When the Lord met him and shone as a light brighter than the noonday sun, he fell from his beast and said, Lord, who art thou? And the Lord said unto him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And so it is from that day forward when the Paul met the Lord and the Lord met up with Paul. He became the Lord's messenger. He became the Lord's servant. He became the Lord's uh, preacher. And so, my brothers and sisters, uh, we find uh, the Apostle Paul uh, a prisoner at Rome. This text helps us to know something about his affection, but not only about his affection, it helps us to know something about his uh, affliction. And so it is today, let me sir, notice on you that when you are a shown up servant of the Lord, thank you son, when you are a shown up servant of the Lord, there is a level of affection that is within you, but don't ever come to the conclusion that because you got so much love for God, so much love for what God has called you to do that you won't have no affliction. Hold on, let me push that button and get that rewind going. Don't ever conclude that because you love God and you love the work of God and you are living for God that your life will be absent of affliction. Here is the Apostle Paul. If anybody loved Jesus, Paul did. 
If anybody knew the Lord, Paul knew him. If anybody had an experience that is unforgettable, Paul had one. But even though he had what he had on the inside as well as on the outside, the Bible helps us to know that afflictions are also a part of the journey. You're going to have to go through a little something, something. Can I get somebody to help me preach this and just tap your neighbor real lightly? Say, neighbor, I got news for you. You're going to have to go through a little something, something. Don't think that just because you know how to sing, you know how to pray, you know how to teach, you know how to preach, you give your money with regularity, and you ain't cheap, you ain't no, help me, Lord Jesus, flea market giver. When it comes to the church, know this, that you still going to have some trouble sometime. But Paul is in prison in Rome in spite of his affection for the Lord, for the gospel, and for a Gentile world that the church at Philippi is primarily made of. As I looked at the labor of Paul, I thought about the fact that his labor is what led him to the letter. And so it is, the book of Philippians is just another one of Paul's letter. There are, I believe, 13 epistles. That means that there are 13 letters that Paul penned during the time of his earthly ministry. And it is in this letter, in this epistle, amen, to the church at Philippi, well, Paul, according to the text, simply does, number one, he makes an acknowledgement. He acknowledges the fact that they have been a supportive church. He acknowledges the fact that they have been a sharing church. He acknowledges the fact that they have been a, a sympathetic church. He acknowledges the fact that they make up a sincere group of believers. And so he gives us in this text, number one, just a general acknowledgement to them that in essence I know what you've been doing. And I know to the extent and the degree that you have been doing it. And I want to put on record today that if nobody else has been kind to me, you have. If nobody else has supported me, you have. If nobody else has blessed me, you have. If nobody else was thinking about me, you were. I want to let you know that even though I'm in jail and I can't be there physically to look you in the eye, to embrace you, to hug you, to hold your hand, shake your hand and tell you thank you, I'm telling you thank you right now. Because I want to acknowledge the fact that you have been kind to me. Can I drop a pen right there and tell you, you know, that's becoming a lost art in our society. Where people know how to do the simple thing of returning a word of gratitude. Like saying thank you. I've opened the doors for people when I got to the door before they did to let them enter into the bank or into a building and they walk through the door as if though it was my job to open the door. Never open their mouth, never look back, never turn around and simply say thank you. Had a young lady open the door for me the other day. I said, hold on little sister, you ain't supposed to be opening no door for me. I'm a real man. I'm supposed to be opening the door for you. I thank you for your thoughtfulness, but know if you ever see me again, I'm supposed to be opening the door for you because you are a lady. And that's what chivalry is. Some of us don't even know what the word chivalry means, but chivalry is when a man act like a man and respect a woman for being a woman and does what he ought to do, even if when he does it, she don't say thank you. So it is, Paul simply acknowledges that gifts under him 
when it seems as if though nobody else cared much about his ministry, his letter is an expression of appreciation. Here's what I like about it, if you will, young preachers who are around me this morning, what Paul writes is not an attempt to beg for more. Paul says, I'm writing this letter to you. And when you listen to the way I'm writing it, I don't want you to get it confused or twisted. I'm not getting ready to say what I'm going to say because it's my feeble attempt to backdoor you and in some way to beg you to do more than what you've already been doing. Paul said, it ain't about that. I'm not writing what I'm writing because my aim is to get more out of you, but I'm saying what I'm saying because my aim is to get more to you. I'm not trying to feather my nest. I'm not trying to foster my own welfare and well-being. I'm not preaching like I'm preaching because I'm trying to get you to do more for me than you done already done. What I'm trying to do is give you the truth of the word of God and tell you that you can't bless the man of God and God don't bless you. I wish I could reach back and grab a prophet from the Old Testament who went to the house of a widow who only had enough meal to make a little whole cake for her and her father. Have I got any Bible readers in here? And when he came there, he said, listen here, the Lord told me to come. And the Lord told me to tell you, because he already know what you got in the barrel. He told me to tell you, when you fix your food, feed me before you start eating. I know some of y'all are saying, hey, that Negro must be crazy. All I got is just enough for me and my son, and he got the unmitigated gall and audacity to tell me to feed him first, knowing all we got is just a little bit of meal, enough to make a small little cake, and that's all we gonna make it on. And here's what he said, God told me to tell you to feed me first. That sounds so selfish, doesn't it? But what the prophet was trying to help her to understand is, I'm not here to get something from you, I'm here to bring something to you. And if you'll obey what God is saying, it ain't about what I'm going to get from you. It's about what God is going to bring to you. I wish I had somebody right here who understands that I've got to tell you what's right, teach you what's right. Not because I'm trying to improve my welfare and well-being, but because my ultimate goal is for God to bless you to go to another level. Is there anybody here that want to go to another level? Go to another level spiritually. Go to another level financially. Go to another level in any and every regard of your life. When I stand, I don't stand because I'm trying to better me. But my goal is to better you. And when God betters you, guess what I believe? When God blesses you, you turn around and bless. The one that God used to be a blessing. So it is, it's not an attempt in the letter for Paul to pump himself up in any type of financial and economic way. He says, let me tell you about the liberality I see in you, Philippians. Surely my labor, it speaks for itself. Surely the letter that I write today ought to speak well for itself. But I want to share something with you that I'm fully abreast of your liberality. Your liberality is a demonstration of your love. You can talk love, but you gotta show love. Hold on, let me say that one more time. You can talk love any day, but you gotta show love someday for love to really evidence itself as love. I know some of you looking at me right now know that it means something to you if the person that you are closely identified with, a man loves you. But you don't want that to just be something in their mind. You want it to be something that comes out of their mouth as well as with their mannerisms. You know when somebody loves you, when there are legitimate, tangible demonstrations of love. And so back home in Philippi, they could have said any day of the week we love Pastor Paul. But loving Pastor Paul meant that they needed to 
demonstrate it in some way or another. I need to tell you, sisters, that a brother who don't want to hold your hand in public, but ready to hold it in private, that ain't a balanced demonstration of love. Why y'all looking at me like that? I know y'all heard me a long way off. That anybody who, yes, Lord Jesus, can only snuggle with you in private, but can't be affectionate in public, something wrong with that. What you want is somebody who knows how to love you when people can see it and when people can't see it. Somebody say, I'm looking for that kind of man who demonstrates, oh, yeah, Lord have mercy. I'm looking for that kind of woman who demonstrates love, amen, in the right way, in a balanced way. And so it is, we see not only the demonstration of their love, but the demonstration of their loyalty. You know, sometimes people are all right as long as things are all right. There's a kind of loyalty that exists to a certain degree, and when you get past that degree, loyalty falls off of the page. They're loyal as long as you are there, but when you ain't there, their loyalty shifts. But can I tell you that uh, you got to know something about who you're really being loyal to. You ought to be loyal to God, number one. And then loyal to the man of God, number two. And then loyal to who you are, number three. Oh, I wish I could stick a pin right there. Because let me tell you something, it yet concerns me that whenever I'm not in the pulpit, there's a loyalty to God that kind of dissipates and disappears. There is a kind of loyalty if I'm not doing the teaching that dissipates and disappears. Oh, I wish I could stick a pin right there. But you got to know who you are being loyal to. You ought to be loyal to the God that woke you up every morning. Saw that you on your way. Whether I'm here, whether I'm absent for a minute, for a moment, for a month, for a year. You got to know where your loyalty lies. Number one, it ought to lie with the Lord God Almighty. Can you help me right here and tell your neighbor nobody but the Lord nobody. has brought me a mighty long way? I didn't ask you to say nothing bad. Let me do it one more time. Can you just join me right here and say nobody but the Lord nobody. has brought me a mighty long way? Thank God for my preacher. Thank God for my pastor. But if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. I wish you could just get one hand up in the hand and say, thank you, Jesus. And even when my preacher couldn't be there, you was there. When my pastor wasn't there, you was there. When he didn't show up, you showed up. When he didn't show out, you showed out. When he couldn't help me, you helped me. When he couldn't save me, you saved me. Know where your loyalty lies, number one. Your loyalty lies with the Lord God Almighty. And then your loyalty ought to lie likewise with the man of God. And so it is. Paul helps us to know something about the demonstration of their loyalty. They couldn't go to him, if you will, in one way, but they went to him in another way. To say to him, Paul, we have not forgotten about you. They saw their partnering with him as partnering with the God who sent him. Let me rehearse that one more time, the reason why they demonstrated their love and their loyalty was because they saw their partnering with Pastor Paul as a means of partnering with the God who sent Paul in the first place. If God had not called him, he would not have called us. If God had not spoken to him, 
he would not have spoken to us. If God had not saved him, he would not have helped us in our salvific experience. And so when we look at Paul, we know he's a man, but in our eyes, he is the man of God. Can I tell you something this morning? I'm a man just like these three men sitting right here on the front row. I put my britches on just like them one leg at a time. At least I think that's what they do. I don't know. Maybe they do like a woman lay on the bed and stick. Well, I don't know what they do, but I'm a man like every other man. I put my britches on one leg at a time. That has to deal with my naturalness, my carnalness, my earthliness. But I need to tell you, I'm more than just a man. When I stand in this pulpit, I am the man of God. You can't see me just like any other man, every other man. You got to say that's God's man. And because he's God's man, I've got to render some respect unto the man of God who's a man like the man that I'm hooked up with. He just ain't the same man. And I ain't going to be because I got the woman I want already. I had somebody. Listen here, Paul says you are partnering with God. When you partner with me, when you help me, you're helping God. When you help me, you're working with God. When you help me, you are assisting God. When you help me, you're doing things that are acceptable unto God and pleasing in his sight. I know you're wondering what does that have to do with my stuff sticking. Well, since you asked the question, let me bring it around one more time. Come on, tell your neighbor, neighbor, whatever you do, don't let your stuff start stinking. Paul said, I got to talk to you about the demonstration of your liberality. In other words, Paul says, why it means so much to me is because you did what you did not so you can be seen by somebody. Lord have mercy. Paul said you were operating in the vein you were operating in not because you wanted to get the attention and the applause of somebody else. And can I tell you something? Whenever you start doing stuff simply because you want somebody else to see what you're doing, your stuff is on the way to stinking. It's no longer good. It no longer has the right fragrance. It no longer has the right aroma. It no longer has the right smell. When I'm doing what I'm doing simply because I want somebody to see me with my big self, with my bad self. Can you touch it and say, don't be like that. Whatever you're going to do, do it for the Lord. And not because you want somebody to see what you're doing and then try to put you on a pedestal for your act in doing it that makes your stuff start to stink. Have I got a witness? Paul said, when I consider the demonstration of your liberality, you don't do what you did because not doing it would make you look bad. Okay, that's one of my run-on sentences that my elementary teacher told me was going to happen because I did it all the time. Here's all that means is you got people who sometimes do stuff simply because they don't want to look bad in the eyes of others if they don't do it. Some people do it to be seen, while some people do it so that they won't look bad in the eyes of others. Can I tell you something right here, my brothers and sisters? Real love evidences itself in such a way that you're not doing what you're doing because you don't want to look bad. Don't give me something on my birthday because you don't want to look bad. Don't give me something as a wedding anniversary gift because you don't want to look bad. Don't give me something in an appreciative way because you don't want to look bad either to me or to somebody else. But do it because deep down in your heart, I wish I had somebody here, 
You love doing what you're doing. You want to do what you're doing. You can't wait to do what you're doing. And the only reason you're doing it is because you don't want to look bad in my eyes or look bad in the eyes of others who expect you to do something. You're doing it for the wrong reason, Paul said. I'm going to compliment you today because you're doing it in the right spirit. You're doing it in the right way. And I know somebody ain't going to like this, but I'm going to tell you the truth anyhow. When you don't do it with the right spirit and do it in the right way, you might as well have not done it at all. Then I've got to hurry get across the field, but there are some lessons that are taught by Paul as he writes this letter to the church at Philippi. Lesson number one is that Christians sow seeds of natural kindness. That's what Christians do. You sow seeds. You plant seeds of natural kindness. Christians, amen, don't mind being kind. Don't mind being compassionate. Don't mind being givers, don't mind being helpers, don't mind supporting to the extent they're able to do so. They sow seeds of natural kindness. With so much meanness and madness in the world, God has got to have somebody who doesn't mind showing kindness to some. When you give into the lives of others, you set yourself up to reap benefits. That's where it is right there, my brothers and sisters, uh, that there are some spiritual principles. And the spiritual principle is that if you want to receive, uh, you got to learn how to be a giver. If you want to harvest something, you've got to learn how to plant or sow something. The Bible says, whatsoever a man sowing, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure the press down. Help me, Lord, running over will men bring into your bosom. There are spiritual principles that are being practiced in the text. Paul said, as a Christian, you are doing what God would want you to do. But know this, you can't honor God. You can't. I operate according to his word and God doesn't do something in return. And so it is, Paul said, that there is a self-denying I see in you for the sake of the servant of God. In other words, the money you could have spent on yourself. You took some of your money and the food you could have fed yourself. You took some of your food and the clothes you could have put on your own back. You took some of your things and sent them to me by the hand of Epaphroditus. And so it is that when I look at you, I see Jesus Christ all in you. Because Jesus was the kind of man who would forget about himself and think of somebody else. Is there anybody here that know the Lord was like that? He forgot about himself and thought about everybody else. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life 
the Bible saying that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was thinking about us rather than about himself. And that's why on a Friday he let one man lay a phony kiss on him and then gave his hand to an old rugged cross. Have I got a witness here? Somebody want to know? Preacher, I've been messed up. Preacher, I've lived wrong. I've done so much bad. But I got news for you that there is somebody who thought more about you than he thought about himself. What can wash? away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again I said nothing but the blood of the Lord is there anybody here who understand what Paul was teaching that your human favor leads to divine favor when you love others God loves you. When you help others, God helps you. When you bless others, the Lord blesses you. When you look out for others, the Lord will. Oh, the Lord will look out for you. Is there anybody here that knows the Lord's eyes is on the sparrow? I'm going to say today I know I wish I had somebody right here who will say I know he watches over me because human favor brings divine favor so Paul said that when you bless me I got news for you that the God that I serve bless you. He will supply your every need. Can you find a neighbor and say, neighbor, I got some needs. Don't fool me here this morning because everybody got a need for something. Somebody here has got a temporal need. You got an earthly need. You got a physical need. You got a need for things in this world. But Paul says, the God I serve is such a God who not only will supply your earthly need, but he's able, he's able, he's able to supply my spiritual needs. He's able Show up on time, won't it, won't it.
Lord. 